Mafia is a word that evokes fear, intrigue and respect when mentioned anywhere on the planet. Today we're going to discuss five of the most brutal Mafia murders recorded in our times. Starting at number five, we have the malicious murder of Salvatore Maranzano, a boss of not just one, but two completely separate Mafia crime families during his criminal reign. This Sicilian-born mobster entered the world on July 31st, 1886, as the youngest of twelve. He learned the valued lesson of fighting to survive at an early age. Out of his twelve older brothers and sisters, only five made it into adulthood. Ironically, Salvatore aspired to become a priest as a kid, but early associations with Mafia members eventually dissuaded him from that decision and led him down a path to end lives instead of saving them. He commenced his criminal career under Sicilian mafioso Don Vito Ferro, who had plans to dominate more than just Italy. In a bid for control of the United States, Don Vito started sending trustworthy underbosses across the pond for a power grab. Maranzano moved to America in the 1920s during the Prohibition era and took root in Brooklyn. Tasked with establishing operations in the US, Maranzano built a real estate broker business as a front for his underworld dealings, running anything from bootlegging and prostitution to narcotics trafficking. During his rise to power, he amassed a crew of associates and made men to handle the illicit works and provide muscle for security and extortion. Utilizing his commanding presence and education, Maranzano garnered extreme respect from his underbosses and other families in New York. One man in particular stood out to Maranzano and was quickly brought under his wing. Young Joseph Bonanno became his protégé, watching and learning everything about the Mafia methods. The 1920s brought a tidal wave of success to the Maranzano empire, but as most people know, the higher you climb, the more attention you attract. This was exceptionally true for Salvatore. Seeing the scales shift on the streets, rival boss Joe Masseria took notice and began flexing his own muscle. Refusing to relinquish control, Maranzano entered into a secret pact with Lucky Luciano. In exchange for the rackets game Masseria was running, Luciano agreed to help kill the competition, beginning the Castellamare's War in February of 1930. On April 15, 1931, Masseria, Luciano and a couple of other associates hit the town. After an extravagant dinner and drinks, they retired to the cardroom to play some poker. It was during a break in the action when it was said that Lucky got up and left the table to go to the bathroom. Before Luciano could even make it to the toilet, Vito Genovese, Albert Anastasia, Joe Adonis and Bugsy Siegel burst through the entrance and opened fire. The barrage of bullets battered everything from the floor up, killing Joe Masseria in an instant. With his end of the bargain fulfilled, Maranzano gave his blessing to Luciano to gain control of Masseria's territories and became Maranzano's lieutenant, overseeing several operations and making himself a staple in the criminal underworld. In an attempt to prevent his own overthrow, Maranzano, along with several other bosses, created the Five Families of New York City to reorganize the crime syndicates. The intention was to unite the families as a unit and designate a hierarchy of authority with each family maintaining a boss, underboss, capos and soldiers. Only full-blooded Italians could ever become made men, with all others wanting to join being associates. However, actions always speak louder than words, and it wasn't long before Maranzano made moves that favored his family's profits over the others. After establishing the five families to spread the power and wealth, Maranzano called a meeting in Wappingers Falls, New York, where the family bosses assembled. It was during this impromptu gathering that Maranzano proclamated his power, declaring himself boss of bosses and taking the majority share in the operations around the city. Reluctantly, the heads of the other families accepted his announcement, but Lucky Luciano felt cheated and commenced his own scheme for control in the shadows. As Maranzano slowly pulled power and profits from the other families, his arrogance and maltreatment of his subordinates started stirring the pot. Trying to imitate the Roman Empire, he pushed for progress in criminal dealings, ushering in new methods and modern business ventures to diversify families. However, he kept a heavy anchor to the old world and its way too. Moustache Pete, a traditional mafioso from Sicily, was loudly opposed to Luciano's partnership with Jewish gangsters Lansky and Seigel. He felt it was a slap in the face to the Italian Mafia name. As it turns out, Moustache Pete was spot on. In September of 1931, Luciano had built his own crew and operations on the side. Realising the severity of the threat, Maranzano placed a bounty on Lucky's head. Pulling the services of notorious hitman Mad Dog Cole, an Irish gangster and assassin for hire, he set into motion the wheels of Mafia justice. But the underworld is full of fiends always trying to place both sides. Not wanting to end up on the wrong end of the imminent war, Tommy Lucchese ran to Luciano and told him he was marked for death. They don't call him lucky for nothing. 
On September 10th, Maranzano sent a request for Luciano and Genovese to attend a meeting at his downtown office in the New York Central Building. Presuming this was when he would be assassinated, Lucky played his hand. Instead of showing up to his office for the meeting, Luciano sent a squad of four Irish gangsters dressed as federal agents. They burst through the doors, immediately gaining control under the guise of badges and brute force. While two of the men wrangled the crowd and disarmed the bodyguards, Lucchesi and the other two hitmen traversed the tumultuous grounds in search of Maranzano. As they reached the conference room, Lucchese pointed out Maranzano to the Irish assassins and watched as they swarmed the room and stabbed him repeatedly. With Maranzano out of the way, Luciano stepped up to become the boss of bosses. However, in a surprise move, Lucky declined the title and abolished it completely, believing that it would only be a matter of time before someone came for his head. In a similar fashion, Luciano established the Commission, a governing force for crime families to regulate power and control. To this day, the Commission still stands as the lead voice for Italian families in the United States, delegating and authorizing all operations to maintain a semblance of peace. When most people hear the term family business, it provokes thoughts of a long-time company started and maintained by a single family that's passed down through the generations. However, for Salvatore Testa, growing up as the son of the Philadelphia family crime boss, Philip the Chicken Man Testa, his predestined family business track was far more diabolical than simply taking the reins of a company once his father retires. Starting in southwest Philadelphia, Salvatore A. Salvi Testa entered the world on March 31st, 1956. His father was an underboss to Angelo Bruno, boss of the Philadelphia crime family during this time period, practically forcing Salvi's path down a road of illegal activities. Surprisingly, unlike most kids raised in a mafia household, young Testa was able to keep his nose clean and graduated from St. John Newman High School in 1974. He even attended one year at Temple University before beginning his own real estate company. As the years passed, and his legitimate business operations thrived as a front to the underworld atrocities taking place below the surface, Tester and his father gained a great deal of respect in the criminal realm. Then, in March of 1980, Salvi's dad got a promotion when his mentor and friend, boss Angelo Bruno, was murdered in cold blood. Elevated and inducted in June that year as the new Philadelphia crime boss, the chicken man Tester now sat on top of the throne dubbing Salvi with a new moniker as the crowned prince of the Philadelphia mob. But life at the top always creates enemies. It would be less than a year of power before Philip Tester was removed from his position. On March 15, 1981, Boss Tester returned to his South Philly home, located directly across from the beautiful Stephen Gerrard Park. On that gorgeous spring day, he drove up onto his driveway and exited the vehicle. As he approached his front door and slid the key into the lock, the nail bomb planted at his feet exploded, killing him instantly. It was initially thought to be an attack by a rival family, but was later discovered that two of his own guys, underboss Peter Casella and Caporegim Frank Narducci Sr., were responsible for an attempt at a coup. This unsanctioned assassination led to the shooting of Narducci and the exile of Casella, who took shelter in Florida. Filling his dad's shoes was Nicodemo Little Nicky Scarfo, an underboss who had been running the Atlantic City operations after the death of Angelo Bruno. Accompanying him to the top was his underboss, Salvatore Chucky Molino. In the wake of his father's death, Salvi was given control over his loan sharking operations in the city. His diligence and education allowed him to thrive, becoming well known as a high earning mafioso within the family. With the feud between factions still roaring after Bruno's death, Scarfo allegedly ordered a hit on longtime rival Harry Rickoben, which failed miserably. While out shopping for food in the Italian marketplace on July 31st, 1982, Salvi was blasted in a drive-by at close range with a shotgun. The shooters, Victor De Luca and Joseph Pedula, were out for retribution over the failed attempt on their boss's life. Salvi survived, and both men were convicted of aggravated assault and weapons charges. This brush with death did nothing to deter Salvi, and his rise to power continued at an extraordinary pace. With his clever tactics and expansion throughout the city into a variety of dealings from drugs and extortion, he was noticed by many in the family. Poised to become one of the next boss of bosses, Salvi took for his bride-to-be the daughter of a high-ranking mob official, Joey Merlino. Everything seemed to be on track for the young, rising star. However, his palette for power became overwhelming and Salvi began making moves outside of the family's consent. Salvi started recruiting guys on the side, establishing his own operations that he wasn't reporting to the family. 
This outraged many of the bosses and underbosses, casting a dark shadow over his once shining reputation. After several meetings, they decided to allow his insolence for the time being, since he was still one of the family's biggest earners. But you can only go so far against the Mafia. With sights of becoming more than just the Philadelphia crime boss, his outside activities burgeoned and brought in a ton of cash. Flying high and believing himself untouchable, Salvi broke his engagement with Molino's daughter. This was a slap in the face that required retaliation. Scarfo initially granted Merlino permission to silence Salvi. But in the face of his daughter's heartbreak and other pressure, he began drinking heavily, and Scarfo was forced to demote and disassociate himself. This didn't impede the attack, though. Scarfo insisted on the murder of Tester and set one of his best guys on the task, Thomas Del Giorno. Understanding Salvi's intellect and suspicious mind, Del Giorno approached Salvi's best friend and confidant, Joseph Pungitore. Threatening to murder Pungitore's dad and siblings, Del Giorno forced his hand and he reluctantly agreed to set up his best friend. On September 14, 1984, Salvi was lured into a store in South Philadelphia under the advice of his friend. Once he entered the shop, Salvatore, Wayne Grand, fired two shots to the back of his head. Salvatore Testa was later found buried in a ditch off the side of the road in southern New Jersey. As a result of this hit, not sanctioned by the commission, Scarfo gained a disloyal reputation amongst the other bosses and was never completely trusted again. Crazy is a word synonymous with many criminals around the world, but to gain the moniker as a notorious mobster incites a level of madness beyond what most can comprehend. So strap in your straight jacket as we delve into the enigmatic life of Joe Gallo, AKA Crazy Joe. Starting his journey in Red Hook, Brooklyn, a rough part of New York City, Joe Gallo was born into the underworld on April 7, 1929. His father, Umberto, was a bootlegger during the Prohibition era, earning a killing in the illegal alcohol racket and investing his earnings into loan sharking. Laundering his criminal earnings through his legitimate diner, Jackie's Charcoal, Umberto made no attempts to hide his illegal activities and mafia associations from his kids. At 16, Joe was involved in an automobile accident where he sustained brain damage, leaving him with a nervous tick. It was at this junction in his life when he decided to partner with a few friends, Peter, Pete the Greek, Diapolis, and Frank Iliano, to start building their own criminal empire with a variety of different crimes. After his first arrest in 1950, Joey was sent to Kings County Hospital Center where he was later diagnosed with schizophrenia, later earning him the title Crazy Joe. It wasn't long until Joey was recognized and brought on board by Joe Profacci, a boss in the Profacci crime family. Gallo began as an enforcer and contract killer but wanted to branch out on his own. He not only managed his father's loan sharking operations, he ventured into the realm of extortion within the jukebox industry, often ensuring he was the only company from which local shops would buy. It's even rumored that he threatened people with a knife to their throat, forcing the sale even though they didn't need the jukebox. Continuing to diversify his revenue streams, Gallo infiltrated the gambling industry with floating dice and high-stakes card games. His business burgeoned, requiring him to acquire a base of operations on 51 President Street. His three-story brick building held details to a majority of his illicit acts and all of his vending machine interests. But most peculiar is the rumor that he kept a pet lion named Cleo in the basement of the building, as he climbed higher and higher, he furtively created fronts, buying nightclubs in Manhattan and setting up two sweatshops in the garment district. But the life of crime often pulls in many directions. Although he was well established in the extortion and gambling racket, making it to the top requires sacrifice and favors along the way. In 1957, Crazy Joe and a few others were allegedly approached by Profaci to execute the hit green lit on Gambino crime boss Albert Anastasia. While he sat in the barber's chair, awaiting a fresh shave and haircut, four men burst through the door, and shot him to death. Corroborating that story, it said that Gallo often jested about the hit, stating, just call us the barbershop quartet. From there, tensions rose in the criminal underworld. With the heat coming from the law and the families, friends turned foe almost overnight. On February 27, 1961, Gallo and his brother kidnapped four top figures from Profaci's crew, including Frank Profaci, his brother. Fearing for his own safety, Profaci fled town and retreated to a home in Florida to lay low until the dust settled. Gallo insisted on killing one of the hostages and demanding a $100,000 ransom for the remaining, but he was shut down by his brother. It would be several weeks, but peace was eventually negotiated and all four were released. But the truce was a farce. Later in August, Profaci ordered the assassination of Frank Gallo and a close associate of the Gallo crew, Joseph Joe Jelly Gioielli. Unaware, Gioielli accepted the seemingly innocuous invitation to go fishing and was never seen again. Frank survived a strangulation attempt thanks to the assistance of a policeman in the right place at the right time. This break in the treaty sparked the first Colombo War between the families. 
But amidst the tumultuous times, Crazy Joe was arrested and convicted of conspiracy and extortion, sentenced to serve 7 to 14 years in prison. During his time in the can, he began taking up unusual hobbies like painting and even befriended several inmates, one of whom was Leroy Nicky Barnes, an African-American drug trafficker. Foreseeing a future in the underworld in Harlem, Gallo educated Barnes on the interworkings of the narcotics industry to aid in his rise to power. Maintaining his connections, when Joey was released from prison in 1971, he refused to honor the peace treaty of 63 and sent his new friends to greet his old enemy. On June 28 that year, a crew was sent to get Columbo at the Second League rally in Columbus Circle in Manhattan. He was shot four times, including once in the head. Columbo miraculously survived, but was paralyzed for the rest of his life. His bodyguards managed to shoot and kill one of the hitmen, an African-American man named Jerome Johnson. This association immediately pointed back to Gallo as the culprit, but the police later stated Johnson was the sole shooter working on his own. The Colombo leaders rejected this find and maintained that Gallo was responsible. On April 7, 1972, Gallo went out with his family to celebrate his 43rd birthday. Arriving at Umberto's Clam House in Little Italy around 4.30 a.m., they sat down to dine and enjoy the private entertainment scheduled for them. As the waiters were transitioning the seafood courses, four men barged through the back door of the restaurant and drew their weapons, firing on Joey Gallo and his family. Crazy Joe jumped into action, pulling his own gun and flipping the table for cover. However, the barrage of bullets from the four revolvers was too much and found their target in Joe's body. With several gunshot wounds, Joey staggered away from the table, presumably to safeguard his family. He managed to drag himself out of the restaurant and into the streets but died outside. His funeral was held under police protection, and his sister vowed bloody revenge during her eulogy. Another war broke out soon after, claiming another ten lives in the aftermath of Joseph Gallo's assassination. Hollywood creates some of the most entertaining characters across every imaginable genre. But in many circumstances, these characters are heavily based on real-life people. The movie Casino is a prime example of a blockbuster built off the back of an actual bad guy. Enter Anthony Spilotro, a vicious villain in the real world who, believe it or not, was actually far worse than the character portrayed by Joe Pesci. Born Anthony John Spilotro on May 19, 1938, young Tony became well acquainted with the mob in Chicago at an early age. Thanks to his family-owned business, Patsy's Restaurant, he was introduced to many gangsters like Gus Alex, Jackie, the lackey Cerrone, and Sam Giancana, who frequented the diner often. Tony and his brothers began their criminal career at a young age, starting small with petty burglary and theft, but escalated quickly up to murder before becoming an adult. Nicknamed Tony the Ant by the media, he was a ruthless repeat offender who kept being freed. The police and media initially called him that little pissant, but couldn't print that word and changed it to ant. By the time he turned 21, Tony the Ant had racked up 13 arrests. Impressed with his bravado and reliability, Sam Mad Dog De Stefano, an enforcer for the outfit, decided it was time to bring him into the family. In 1962, Tony was responsible for the torture and murder of a couple of thieves who ravaged a Chicago neighborhood where the Mafia had established operations. Thought of as a dramatization, it's rumored that Tony actually placed one of the culprit's heads in a vice and squeezed him to death. Those horrific murders were eventually dubbed the M&M &M murders by the press. In a tactical move to show strength in a waning extortion industry, Spilotro was placed in charge of the Vegas Casino Skims operation, replacing Marshal Caifano. Caifano bolstered his own brutal reputation, widely known for using a blowtorch as his instrument of education. However, with casinos cracking down and the utilization of federal agency assistance, Caifano was blacklisted from almost every major casino in Vegas, preventing him from even setting foot on the properties. This didn't stop the Mafia, though. With Tony the Ant in charge of the collections for basically every casino in Las Vegas, they brought in millions of dollars for the outfit. Pleased with the success, the outfit named Frank Lefty Rosenthal in command of the Stardust, with Tony's job keeping him happy with the skimming operation. But the ever-theatrical Tony attracted unwanted attention almost immediately. In 1972, Tony was indicted on a murder charge of a real estate broker back in the Windy City. It's said that the hit was a favor to his mentor, De Stefano, a man regarded for his violent nature. The crime certainly carried that connotation. The victim was literally cleaved to death, with signs of large chunks being sliced out of his body. Ironically, when his mentor De Stefano was indicted and en route to trial, he was assassinated on his journey, 
savagely shot down in the streets, it's believed that Tony the Ant was responsible for the hit. But crime doesn't sleep, and with Tony behind the wheel, Vegas was booming with business. In 1974, the Los Angeles Times reported that there were more gangland-style shootings in that one year than the previous 25 combined. And even though the casino extortion racket was still raking in tons of chips, Tony felt the need to expand his reach. He eventually built his own crew, calling them the Hole in the Wall Gang. They plundered and pilfered high-end homes in the Vegas region, stealing anything from furs to fancy jewellery, all of which didn't have to be sent back to Chicago. His side hustle generated so much business, Tony brazenly launched his own pawn shop in 1976 to fence his own stolen goods. Luck certainly seemed to be on Tony's side during his prolific career. Not only was he maintaining the reins of the skimming regime and his profitable, legitimate business, but he also managed to beat several indictments along the way. Even though his pawn shop was raided, authorities apparently mishandled the legal avenues with which they gathered the evidence, leading to a mistrial. A few years later, he and a few members of his gang were busted for burglary, but also beat the charge. Dodging low-rent convictions for stealing was definitely a staple for Tony, but the past eventually caught up. Pinned for the M&M murders of the thieves from Chicago, Anthony Spilotro faced a double homicide charge for the first time in his life. With an informant and a mound of evidence, they attacked every aspect of his character and past criminal record. Starring down the barrel of two life sentences, Tony the Ant scurried away unscathed yet again. But in the course of his legal battles, the war on extortion with the Vegas casinos was being lost, with profits plummeting due to even more restrictions and federal interference. By 1986, the outfit had enough of the troubles Tony created in his wake. On June 14th, Tony and his brother Michael disappeared after leaving Michael's home in Oak Park. Two days later, Michael's wife, Anne, reported both of them missing. In the search, police discovered the 86 at Lincoln a few days later, in a motel parking lot near the O'Hare International Airport. It wouldn't be until June 22nd that the brothers would surface. Found beaten to death and practically naked, the two were stacked on top of each other, buried in a cornfield. The culprit of the crime remained under the radar until April 2005. A small group of 14 outfit members were indicted on 18 murder charges. One Albert Tocco, a capo in the family, was convicted of the double homicide after his wife testified against him, stating she drove him to the cornfield to bury the bodies. Over the centuries, mafia murders have been a stitch in the side of the legal community. However, even the mob can overstep when targeting specific individuals. Let's dive into the tale of Judge Giovanni Falcone's tragic demise at the hands of the Italian mafia. Starting his journey in Sicily on May 18, 1939, Giovanni Falcone was the youngest of three children. Raised in La Calza, a battered neighborhood after the 1943 Allied invasion of Sicily, he quickly understood the meaning of social injustice and wrongdoing. Falcone was consistently involved in fights as a kid, standing up for any friends of other weaker children being bullied by larger guys. Even though the mob wasn't extremely prominent during his upbringing, he did befriend a local pal, Tommaso Spadaro, who would later become a prolific trafficker and murderer. Coincidentally, during his childhood, Sicilians in general didn't recognize the Mafia as an organized group, and even regarded statements to the contrary as nothing but propaganda created by the North to manipulate and frighten. In school, he became close friends with Paolo Borsellino, a neighborhood pal who played soccer with him at the Piazza Maggione. Even though the two had fundamentally different political and economic views, they maintained a tight bond over the years and even attended the same school at Palermo University, where they both studied law. After a brief stay at the Livorno Naval Academy, it was clear to Falcone and his dad that he was too independent to join the armed forces and chose to stick with a law degree. After graduating in 1961, Falcone began practicing law, but was quickly appointed to a judgeship just three years later. After several years of overseeing proceedings, dealing from penal law to bankruptcy, Giovanni Falcone joined the Ufficio Istruzione, or Office of Instruction, in a ridiculously tumultuous time during 1980. In the prior year, two key figures of the investigations into the Mafia for heroin trafficking throughout Italy were ruthlessly assassinated. Judge Cesare Terranova had been the lead prosecutor during the 1960s and was murdered on September 25th. 
Just two months before his execution on July 21st, Boris Giuliano, head of the police investigations of the Mafia, was killed to set an example. Recognising the severed heads just spawned new invigorated combatants, the Mafia struck again almost immediately. On Cinco de Mayo in 1980, Giuliano's replacement, Carabinieri Captain Emanuele Basile, assigned the lead to the task force investigating the drug-running operations was murdered. The very next day, in an act of retaliation and tenacity, prosecuting judge Gaetano Costa personally signed more than 50 arrest warrants, all targeting everyone involved in the smuggling operation from key figures down to the mules of the Spatola Inzerillo Gambino clan. Reports from the detectives indicated that the family was moving massive amounts of heroin through Sicily to New York. Once delivered, the Gambino family would take the shipment and disseminate the product down through the families for distribution. That audacious act of defiance against the Mafia produced an almost instant reprisal. On August the 6th, 1980, Judge Costa was killed on the orders of Inzerillo for his interference. Giovanni and his family were assigned bodyguards the next day. Taking the reins with enthusiasm and temerity, Judge Falcone initiated breakthrough techniques he learned in bankruptcy court to build his case against the mob. Obtaining every bank record and all travel history from the organization, he was able to follow the money trail and began orchestrating one of the largest criminal investigations in the world. Quickly realizing how deep and far the drug trafficking industry reached, Falcone was one of the first magistrates to create concrete bonds with other national agencies in order to build the case. During his crusade, he discovered that manufacturing labs for heroin had been moved from Marseille to Sicily. This blatant transition forced Falcone to reach out to the US Justice Department for assistance. And by the end of 1981, Judge Giovanni Falcone completed his case, winning 74 convictions with his web of solid evidence, bank and travel records, seized heroin shipments, fingerprint and handwriting analyses, wiretapped conversations and first-hand testimony. Though he stayed vigilant in his pursuit of justice, he was constantly hamstrung by a paucity of resources at his disposal. On his side, a revolutionary seeking to swing the power back into the hands of the law, Pio Latore proposed new laws enabling prosecutors to charge the Mafia with conspiracy and cease assets. Understanding the gravity of the proposed law, the Mafia lobbied, bought and intimidated anyone involved, leading to two years of stagnation before Latore was assassinated. This sparked the need to send in reinforcements. Heeding that call was the general of the Italian Carabinieri, Carlo Alberto di La Chiesa, who arrived in Sicily on April 30th, 1982. His orders were simple, crush the Italian Mafia. On September 3rd, 1982, he was publicly executed in the street with his wife standing beside him. Citizens erupted in outrage, protesting and demanding justice and results from the government. La Torre's law was passed 10 days later, signaling the beginning of the power shift to come. Falcone continued on his journey, taking part in the Palermo informal anti-mafia pool, a group of clandestine magistrates around the world dedicated to sharing info and developing unique strategies to take down the mob. Among these judicial members was Falcone's old friend Paolo Borsellino. This unsung group of heroes laid the foundation for the Maxi trial. This daring attack on the Sicilian Mafia lasted almost two years, indicting 475 defendants. Of the men on trial, 338 were convicted, setting a record of 2,665 years of prison dispersed amongst them in one case, including the 19 life sentences handed down to key members like Michel Greco and Giuseppe Marchesi. The linchpin of the legal action was the first mafioso informant to testify, Tommaso Buscetta. Initially thought to be a plant by the Mafia, his accounts of the mob being a single organisation led by the Commission convinced Falcone of his credibility. His eyewitness statements during the trial were the leading factor that incited the convictions. Although Judge Falcone had created an impressive record of wins against the Mafia, he was continually met with roadblocks from his own team. Not believing in the Commission, his boss began placing Falcone in mundane cases like car theft, but Giovanni persisted to the point that on June 20th, 1989, a bag of dynamite was found by the beach house he rented for a family vacation. Fortunately, two policemen had disarmed the bomb before it could detonate. But the threat against his life and family this time seemed closer than ever, convincing Falcone that it was an inside job. After years of appeals, the maxi trial sentences were being upheld in court, keeping most of the new inmates behind bars. Seeking retribution, Reina, the top boss then, ordered the assassination of Salvatore Lima and Giovanni Falcone. On March 12, 1992, Lima was brutally murdered by the Mafia hitman. Wanting to send a clear message, Reina ordered a special attack on Falcone. After months of planning, prepping and even practicing with dry runs, the trap was set. 
On May 23rd that same year, Falcone and his wife were driving from the airport back home, escorted by three police officers. On the usual route taken, the car passed the checkpoint and exploded on sight. The force of the blast was so powerful it registered as a small earthquake. All five were killed instantly. In the aftermath of the assassinations, Italian authorities launched a decisive counterattack. In the months and years to follow, police and federal agents cracked down on mafia crime in the major cities. It took less than a year, but on January 15, 1993, Rina and an associate were arrested for the murders of Judge Falcone, his family and bodyguards, as well as Falcone's friend's death, Judge Paolo Borsellino. Rina was sentenced to life in prison and died in 2017 behind bars. Though the Mafia may have won that battle against Falcone, his legacy lives on in his successors, who lay their lives on the line each day in memory of those fallen and for justice. Giovanni Falcone's life and work serve as a powerful reminder of the importance of courage, integrity and unwavering commitment in the face of injustice. Despite facing constant threats and knowing the risks involved, Falcone never wavered in his pursuit of justice. His legacy continues to inspire those who fight against organised crime and all forms of corruption worldwide. His story is a testament to the power of one individual to make a difference, even in the face of daunting obstacles. Falcone's innovative investigative techniques, his relentless pursuit of the truth, and his unwavering determination to hold criminals accountable set a new standard for law enforcement. His work has had a lasting impact on the fight against organised crime, both in Italy and around the world. Falcone's legacy is not merely about legal victories. It is about the courage to stand up for what is right, even when it is dangerous to do so. Giovanni Falcone's life may have been cut short by violence, but his spirit lives on. His unwavering commitment to justice, his courage in the face of danger, and his belief in the power of the law continue to inspire people around the world.